Fuktron has been a high school Latin teacher for more than 20 years while also simultaneously establishing himself as a highly sought after tattooer in the Northeast. His acclaimed memoir, Saigon, a misfits memoir of great books, punk rock, and the fight to fit in, received the 2020 New England Book Award for nonfiction and the 2021 Maine Literary Award for memoir. Saigon was named a best book of the 2020 by Amazon, Audible, Kirkus Reviews, and many other publications. He has a forthcoming children's book in collaboration with best-selling author, illustrator, Pete Oswald, entitled Cranky. He lives in Portland with his wife and his two daughters. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Phuc Trang. Thanks so much, um, Paige and uh, Vermont Humanities and Manchester Library. I'm um, so um, grateful and um, humbled to be here and to um, be invited to speak to you all. Um, I am not a, a scholar <laughs> of a whole lot <laughs> or, and the things that I am a scholar of, nobody really wants to hear me talk about, which really involves the subjunctive mood and uh, Greek and Latin grammar. Um, but I would love to talk to you and share my story with you and the things, what, what few things I've learned along the way in writing my memoir. Um, how does a Vietnamese refugee become a tattooer and a Latin teacher for 20 years? And then how does he then end up writing a memoir uh, and then working on a children's picture book? Um, my resume is a little bit of a train wreck or a, a lane swerving resume, as I like to call it. Um, I think it mirrors my motorcycle riding style. So <laughs> that totally tracks. Um, so I thought I would just talk a little bit about my journey um to here and then um i would read a little bit from my book um during which i'll share a slideshow um and frankly my favorite part of any talk is the q a so um if there if there is anybody actually out there listening um please feel free to um prep some questions and fire them my way and there really is no question that's off limits my memoir is pretty um raw i would say so um so yeah feel free to ask um, questions or, or think about questions you'd like to ask during the Q&A portion. Um, so my name is Phuc Tran. Um, I was born in uh, Saigon, Vietnam, and uh, my family came to the United States in uh, 1975 at the end of the Vietnam War. And uh, my grandparents worked for the U.S. Embassy. So thankfully for us, um, leaving Vietnam was not as harrowing as it would have been for some people. Um, so we were part of that initial wave in 1975 that came here to the United States. Um, and we were not part of the so-called boat people who came later in the 1980s. Um, and so uh, in 1975, we came to the US and the US government had set up for uh, relocation camps in the U um, in the in America to resettle about 130,000 uh, Vietnamese refugees. Um, there was one in California, uh, Southern California. There was one in Florida, I believe. There was one in Arkansas, and the one that we went to was in Pennsylvania um, at a place called Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. And um, so we were there for a few months. Um, until we were sponsored by some very nice Lutherans um, who lived in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And so um, the, actually two families that lived in Carlisle sponsored um, my family and my extended family. So my grandparents, aunts and uncles, actually my great grandmother was also with us, my parents and me. Um, so I believe there were about 12 of us total. Um, and if, in that sponsorship, what they did was they found housing for us. They found jobs that we could sort of move into right away that didn't require a mastery of English necessarily um, because none of us spoke any English. Um, my father, when he was in Vietnam, uh, was a lawyer um, and, a, and an aspiring politician. So, um, you know, he was educated, very educated. And then um, his first job in the United States was uh, driving a cement mixer because um, it didn't require, it just required a driver's license and no English. Um, and uh, needless to say, that was, that transition was very difficult for him. Um, you know, the other interesting thing about growing up in Carlisle and about just sort of that whole resettlement process was that um, uh, the federal government had in place 
um, a policy specifically regarding Vietnamese refugees. It was called the refugee dispersion policy, which basically meant that they did not want Vietnamese refugees to settle near each other, um, at least initially. Like the plan was to disperse the refugees as much as possible. Um, the thinking behind this was that um, basically prior to 1975, there were very few, if any, Vietnamese people living in the United States. Um, and so with this influx of 130,000 people, um, the US government did not want Vietnamese people to form, I think, I believe the word is cultural ghettos, um, you know, in, in the style of, say, the Irish, the Italian, you know, the Germans and the Jews, you know, a century earlier. Um, you know, the, the federal government thought, if that happens, these folks will not acculturate or acclimate, assimilate, you know, pick your word, um, as quickly. So, um, so through this policy, the refugee dispersion policy, my family settled in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and we were the only Vietnamese family in the town. Um, uh, especially, well, while I was growing up, I was the only Vietnamese kid in my class for a very long time, I think up until high school, you know, um, unless unless the other Vietnamese person in the school is like my cousin or my brother or whoever. So, um, so I think, so in common, so that was interesting to you know say the least you know the it was the 70s and the 80s and carlisle was um predominantly white meaning like 90 something percent white 93 percent white i believe i looked up the sort of demographic statistic while i was working on my memoir um and i don't think that's changed much even into the 21st century um and so you know growing up in a town that's predominantly white in small town PA, um, as the only Vietnamese kid is, was challenging. Um, you know, and I think layered on top of that was also, you know, the, what I can say now was sort of the post-traumatic stress for my parents and my grandparents of, um, you know, coming to a country that they didn't know or choose to come to, um, trying to learn a language, trying to survive. Um, so that was, what that led to for me and my family was, you know, a lot of dysfunction and to be totally blunt, a lot of violence and abuse at home. Um, and so that was, that was sort of the backdrop for mine growing up in Carlisle, um, you know, being, feeling very isolated in my town uh, in terms of not having, you know, a community um, and then going home and feeling uh, deeply unsafe at home as well. Um, and so in, um, in high school, um, I found two things that really sort of saved my life. Um, one, I found skateboarding and punk rock. <laughs> and, um, you know, that was at, for me at the time, like that was the thing that I was like, wow, there are kids that feel really alienated and they feel like they don't have a place in the world and they're really angry about it. And it was, that was incredibly liberating, um, for me to discover, you know, and through that, I found a small group of, you know, punk rock kids and skateboarders in my town who, and we all just sort of banded together because there was only like 10 of us, you know, <laughs> and everybody else sort of was out to um, keep us in our place as it were. Um, and the other thing I think maybe potentially as important, if not more important than discovering punk rock was um, I discovered the Western canon literature you know i secretly fell in love with reading books because they made me feel not alone they you know i felt deeply seen and understood when i read the scarlet letter by nathaniel hawthorne you know it was the first time that i read this you know a book and i was like wow hester Prynne, i really get you i totally get being ostracized in your town and being a weirdo you know and so i sort of surreptitiously read all the great work, as many of the great works of the Western canon as I could or was interested in, you know, because I was a teenager. So I would sort of like read three pages or four pages into something. And if it didn't sort of catch, you know, my eye or my sort of mental eye, I would just sort of move on. So, um, uh, you know, so things like, you know, James Joyce, uh, you know, I would try to read and I'd be like, Ugh, I'm I don't think I'm cut out for Ulysses. Um, but other things like, you know, um, Walden, you know, uh, the metamorphosis, crime and punishment, the Iliad, um, you know, I just read voraciously because I worked at my town library 
Um, so I sort of was surrounded by and had access to all these books. Um, so, you know, I'm telling you this story because that is a story, this idea of like the story of discovering great book and punk rock, you know, and how that saved my life. Like I didn't tell that story for a long time, like 30 some years, almost 40 years. Um, I just felt like it was like too weird of a story. It didn't sound like anyone else's story. It certainly didn't sound like anyone else's story from my town. Um, you know, and, and for those of you, if anybody's listening and who didn't grow up in the eighties, like, you know, I think like the, the pressure and the expectation to conform, uh, was very strong, like this sort of like homogenous and homogenized monolithic culture, um, was so prevalent in, uh, the United States and in American pop culture. And so I just felt like I should keep that story like under the bushel, like nobody wants to hear that weird story. Um, and so I didn't talk about it for a long time. I think maybe a takeaway, one takeaway from this talk and about my journey, I think is the value and the power in telling your story. Um, and the other one maybe is just to say yes <laughs> to opportunities. Um, I think that will recur maybe a little bit. So, um, so I went off to college. I thought I was going to major in art and English. I ended up ac sort of ac not accidentally, but I ended up majoring in classical languages and literature instead. Um, and then I went off to graduate school um, to do my master's in um, Latin and teaching classical languages and literature. Um, and then at the end of grad school, I simultaneously applied for a tattoo apprenticeship in New York City. Um, I got it. And so I moved to New York City, where I taught Latin during the day at a fancy private school in New York City. And then at night, I would go down to the, you know, Lower East Side or Chelsea or wherever I was working and learn how to be a tattooer, as one does. Um, <laughs> um, and so um, I think like the the next sort of most pivotal part of my life is um in my late 30s, I started doing therapy. So big shout out to mental health, taking care of your mental health. Um, I, you know, my wife and I found out that we were going to have our first child, our daughter. And, um, you know, I thought about, I was really delighted. And I thought, this is amazing. I'm so excited to be a parent. Um, and then I thought about the flip side of that. You know, I thought about, oh, how do I feel as a son? You know, now that I'm about to be a parent. And, um being being a son being a child did not feel good to me um and and that for me was a sign that i had something that i had to fix or to work on uh, because i felt like whatever energy or sort of baggage that i had around the feeling of being a son i was going to bring to it as a parent um and so i did therapy and started doing that in my late 30s like mid to late 30s and um right at the end of that um, a friend of mine emailed me and said, hey, uh, Fook, I'm going to nominate you to give a TED talk here in Maine, um, like a TEDx talk. So um, for those of you, I, I I guess I won't explain what TED talks are, but you can Google it later. But um, basically, it's just like a 12 minute lecture. Um, and so a friend of mine said, hey, I'm going to nominate you to give this TEDx talk. Um, and it was you know, it was just sort of like a happy circumstance or confluence of things that I was just sort of finishing up, you know, my counseling and, and therapy. Um, my daughter had just been born and um, I had this opportunity to give this talk. Um, and so I was feeling really cavalier, <laughs> emboldened. I'm not sure right what the right word is. Um, and so I um, went to the TEDx committee and I pitched them this idea um, about what I wanted to give, my, you know, my talk about, and they were excited about it. And so I thought, okay, like, this is going to be the biggest platform that I'm probably ever going to have, like this, these 300 people in the Bates Auditorium. And, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to really go for it, you know, I was sort of giving myself a, a pep talk, you know, I'm going to talk about all the things that are really important to me, because I really want this talk to be authentic. And, um, you know, and, and if I fail, then I want to fail spectacularly, like, but I'm not afraid of failure, because I've had, I've had all this therapy, right? Like, <laughs> if this isn't the ultimate test for how good your therapist is, I don't know what is, right? So you do all this therapy, you're like, Oh, my God, and I'm going to give this TED talk. Okay, let's go. Um, so I thought, okay, so I'm going to talk about 
I'm going to talk about all the things that I've never talked about in public. I'm going to talk about my story and I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to talk about being a refugee growing up bilingual. I'm going to talk about grammar. Um, I'm going to talk about Star Wars, pop culture, punk rock, you know, John Hughes movies. Um, I'm going to talk all about all of that in 12 minutes. So what could possibly go wrong? And I'm going to connect it all somehow. Um, yeah, it sounds insane. So if you want to watch it later, you can just Google me and my TED Talk will come up. So I, I gave the TED Talk um, uh, in 2012. And um, uh, and it seemed like the audience enjoyed it. Um, and I was I felt really good about the talk. And I was like, Ooh, OK, that was great. Um, and um, and after that, I, I felt really energized that the, that was the first time that I ever shared my story about being a refugee, about growing up in small town PA, um, about my family's harrowing escape from Vietnam. Um, and people loved it. And so that put this idea in my mind that maybe I would do more live storytelling. You know, there was this thing that I would, had heard on public radio and I was like, oh, this thing, it's called The Moth. And so I just started there, you know, it was start, it was starting to sort of happen around Portland where, you know, people would sign up to do these like open mic um, live storytelling events. And so, um, you know, I thought maybe I'll do that. Um, you know, me, in, in the meantime, uh, maybe like six months after I'd given the TED talk, um, I got this email from National Public Radio and somebody, a producer there said, hey, we... Um, heard your TED talk and, and we think it's really great. We'd like to air it on NPR's TED radio hour. Do you have a few minutes to interview, be interviewed with Guy Raz? And, and so I thought, oh, that's, that's not, that's not what I expected to ever happen from this TED talk, but sure. Like I'll take the meeting. I'll talk to Guy Raz. <laughs> that's the other takeaway. Always take the meeting. Um, so I said, sure, I'll talk to Guy Raz. So I talked to Guy Raz, you know, they, they post my TED talk on NPR's TED radio hour. It goes out in the world. So like now all of a sudden, like, you know, whatever, a hundred, 200,000 people are watching it, you know, and that's very strange. Um, but here in Portland, like in my little bubble of Maine, like I was just getting up on stage once or twice a year um, to do this live storytelling. So, you know, each time I would do it, I would, you know, write a seven minute story, true, a true story from my life. I would get up on stage. I would tell it. And every time I told the story, folks from the audience would come up afterwards and they would say like, oh my gosh, I love that. You know, when are you going to tell your story next? Or, you know, when's the next time you're going to do this? Um, and then, so I did that for four or five years, um, four years. And that was when I sort of had this idea, like, oh, like maybe I, maybe I have like more stories to tell. Maybe if I dare to be so grand, you know, <laughs> to have delusions of grandeur, maybe when I'm 80, and I'm retired and I can't teach anymore and my hands don't work because I can't tattoo. Maybe I'll write a book then. Um, and, and I was like, yeah, maybe I will, you know, like, but who knows? It's, you know, so far off. And um, that was probably in 2016. And, and right around then I got this email out of the blue, this um, agent, this literary agent in New York City cold called me, um, sent me this email and just said, hi, um, I'm a little late to the game. I saw your TED talk from 2012. Um, it seems like you have a really interesting story and an interesting way to tell it. Um, and I wrote back to her, I was like, thanks. Uh, um, she was like, would you ever be, would you ever be interested in writing a memoir? And I was like, Hey, like, I'm really busy. You know, I teach Latin during the day. I tattoo at night. Uh, I have two young kids at home. Um, uh, but maybe, you know, <laughs> always take the meeting. Um, so I, I, I said, maybe I'll think about it. Um, and so I just sort of like ghosted her for a little while, but like once a month she would email me and just be like, Hey, I'm still here. Like super interested in reading anything that you would want to write. Um, no pressure, uh, you know, just feel free to jot some notes down and send it my way, you know? And, and this went on for about four months where once a month she would email me and I would say, yeah, I'm really, really busy, but I'm thinking about it. Um, and then in the winter of 2016, I think, um, I just thought, well, okay, um, this opportunity doesn't happen all the time where, you know, an agent will just reach out to somebody and say that they're interested. And so I, I sat down over a weekend and wrote an essay and, you know, thought I would send it off to her. 
Um, but when I wrote the essay, I, again, I think very similar to the TED talk, I really wanted it to be as, as true to me and my voice and my story as I, as true to all of that as I, as it could be. Um, you know, I thought about it, like, you know, if someone asks you out to prom and you decide that you're going to put on the weirdest, craziest outfit that you possibly can. And if they still want to ask you to prom, then you're probably going to have a great time. Um, so in the essay that I wrote for my now agent, you know, I, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to write about the refugee experience, my, you know, my experience growing up in small town PA, I'm going to, you know, draw from like pop culture and like punk rock and song lyrics. And it's, it's going to be me. Um, and if she's excited about it, then, then we can do this. Um, otherwise I, I don't want to write a book that's, you know, that is pandering to some sort of mysterious audience or, you know, even worse, like, you know, that is just so, uh, inauthentic to who I am. I think it's like a holdover of like, sort of like sort of eighties punk rock, right? Like you want to be true to yourself. Um, and so I wrote this essay, I send it off to her. Um, I get this email back from her. She's like, this is great. I'm faxing you a contract for representation. And so then I was like, oh shit, <laughs> now I have to write a book. <laughs> um, and so for those of you who don't know, um, so nonfiction, when it's written, it is, um, you don't write the whole book. You write what's called a proposal. Um, and so basically you write a chapter of your book and then you write a very deep and detailed outline of what the rest of your book would look like. Um, and then you do market research um, a little bit like on who who you think your potential readers will be. Um, and then you write, you talk about comp titles, so comparable titles, meaning like you're basically, it's like a sales pitch to a publisher saying, hey, I've got a story, a way to tell the story that's interesting. Um, and it's going to make money. It's viable. This is a good, you know, investment because, you know, let's not fool ourselves, right? Publishing is, you know, it's a business. Um, and I'm a good investment. You know, that's essentially um, the proposal. Um, so we worked, I worked on the proposal for about a year. So from 2016 to 2017, um, it, it took a long time. Um, because I ended up writing two chapters of my book instead of just one. Um, and we sent that out. And then there was uh, Amazon and Flatiron were both interested in it. So there was like a little back and forth about like who um, I was going to go with as my publisher. Um, I ultimately went with uh, Flatiron, which is traditional, you know, sort of New York big five publishing. Um, they're an imprint of Macmillan. And um and then I started working on my book. Um, so that was 2017. Um, so I worked on the manuscript for a year. Um, and that was uh, very challenging, I think, because I was still teaching Latin full time during the day. I was tattooing at night. I still had two small kids at home who never saw me, uh, never mind my poor sort of martyr of a wife. And um, so I would write every other Sunday for a year. So, so in any given month I had like, I would, I would write a, on a Sunday from, you know, like eight or nine until five or six, you know, until I was done. And then I would take two weeks off, you know, and in, in those intervening two weeks, I would be jotting notes down and keeping track of ideas. And then like that second, the third Sunday would roll around and I would go to, you know, the library and like, just lock the door and then write for, <laughs> yeah, just write until I was done. Um, and so after, at the end of a year, uh, I had my manuscript and then I sent it off to my um, editor. I'd actually been sending her bits and pieces along the way. But so the, the writing of the manuscript took a year um, and then the editing took another year. So in 2000, um, so that was 2016, 2000, so 2017 into 2018, um, uh, or no, 18 into 19, sorry. Um, I was editing with my editor, you know, so she would read it and send me, you know, notes. And then, you know, and it just takes a while because you've got this whole book, you know, so it's like sending big chunks of it, you know, back and forth. And um, so that took a year. And so I finished the book. The book was done with editing and everything it was done, done, done. That was in 2019. And um, in the meeting with my publisher, you know, I think they're very savvy about like when to release a book and they're thinking, well, you know, we want the release of the book to be as impactful as possible. Um, and so this is at the like spring of 2019, spring or fall of 2019. Uh, they're thinking, well, you know, why don't we time your book with 
um, the fall of Saigon. Like that would be interesting. And I was like, oh yeah, that's, that is really interesting. So the fall of Saigon is in April of April 30th. Um, and so I remember very clearly, like we're sitting in this room in New York city. They're like, yeah, April of 2020, what, what's, what's going on in, you know, April of 20, spring of 2020. That's totally fine. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, put a pin on the calendar. We're like, all right, you know, um, this is when it's coming out. And, and then of course, you know, there was this little thing called COVID that happened in March of 2020. Um, and <laughs> Lots of people canceled their or postponed their book publications, but we sort of like steered right into the storm. We released the book, you know, like I learned all about this thing called Zoom. Um, we had like a Zoom book release. Um, and I think, you know, at that point, again, I think I just felt like I'm, I wrote a book. Like I don't, like I never even expected that I would write a book and it's coming out. So, I mean, it, it is what it is. You know, I just, you know, it, it wasn't that I was sad that I didn't have like a traditional book release or anything like that. Cause I, it was just so surreal. And also like, it was like one month into COVID. So I think like everyone thought that we were all going to die anyway. So I was just like, well, at least I wrote a book. Um, and so, <laughs> um, and again, like, I think just sort of leaning into this idea of like the power of telling your story and telling it in an authentic way. Um, maybe six months after my book came out, I got, um, my agent called me, and she said, well, um, I just got off the phone with a producer in Los Angeles who read your book. And he wants to know if you would, or if you're at all interested in working in the writer's room for a TV show on HBO. And I was like, hmm. I was like, I'll always take the meeting. Um, so <laughs> I get on the Zoom, I talk to the producer, I talk to the showrunners. And um, and then after that, I signed on to um, work in the writer's room for HBO. Um, you know, I was still tattooing full time. So I was like, look, I could do it maybe like three days a week, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But like, I can't just torpedo my day job. Um, so I worked for about seven or eight months on um, uh, HBO's English language adaptation of a film called Parasite. It was this Korean language film. It won the Oscar in 2021, I think, um, or 2020. Um, but yeah, so we worked on that for um, seven or eight months. And then HBO just put it on a shelf. They said, thanks for your service and sent us on our way. <laughs> um, and then right when that ended, um, I got this strange email um, from uh, an illustrator um, and his agent, this guy named Pete Oswald. And they said, hey, we read your memoir and we we're wondering if you would ever consider writing a children's picture book. Um, if you've read my book, you know, even if you haven't, there's there's like nothing in my book that screams out this guy should be writing for children like at all. But I was like, sure, I'll take the meeting. Why not? Um, so I get on the Zoom with Pete and his agent um, and they tell me about this character, you know, this really angry construction crane who... Um, yeah, who <laughs> the whole point of the story is that he has a very flat character arc. He's just like unpleasant and cranky the entire way through the book. Like he never gets better. Uh, and they were like, we think you'd be perfect for it. And I was like, oh, OK, um, you're you're thank you. Um, but I just said to them, you know, sure, let me let me I'll write it on spec, which means you don't have to pay me. I'll write this picture book. And if you like it, awesome. And if you don't, that's OK. Um, so I, Pete sends me like six drawings of Cranky the Crane. Um, so Pete had come up with the character, but he is not a writer. Um, and so they were looking around for writers and, um, uh, for whatever reason they, you know, serendipitously had read my book and then also thought that I might be a good fit. Um, and so I, I wrote the, a draft of, of the Cranky manuscript. I sent it off to Pete and his agent. They both read it. They loved it. Um, and they, called their editor at HarperCollins and read it to her over the phone. Um, and she was so excited. And, and so they were like, yep, she'll be in touch. And I was like, great, I guess I wrote a children's picture book. Um, and so at the meeting with um, HarperCollins, um, the editor there said, you know, we love Cranky. You know, we definitely want to buy the, the book from you. And I was like, great, thank you. And they're like, we also need you to write us two more sequels. And I was like, okay, so, so I guess I, yeah, I'm taking the meeting on that one too. Um, and just very recently last year, um, uh, I got an email from the moth, um, like 
and they were coming to Portland and um, they'd gotten my name from somebody about storytelling. And so um, I just worked, you know, this was, I think last um, spring, um, I worked with the Moth producer um, on crafting a story for their main stage. And um, yeah, so, you know, like it, it's sort of the strange trajectory, you know, I started off like sort of telling my story and the storytelling journey um, in front of 300 people at Bates Auditorium. And then last spring, um, you know, I, I at this point, you know, it's not over. <laughs> I don't want to say like I'm, I'm dying or I'm dead, but, you know, <laughs> I'm sort of landing that story in a space where I just told my story from my life in front of, you know, over a thousand people, you know, in front of this auditorium. Um, so it's been, it's just been incredible. Um, and, and at every step of the way, I feel really affirmed that um, there's a lot of power and a lot of connection for audiences in a person standing up and telling their story um, and telling their story in an authentic and true way. Um, so I think I'll pause there because that's really, you've just like heard my whole life story. Um, and <laughs> for better or worse, I also wrote a book. Um, it's my memoir. Um, it's not about my whole life. It just goes up until high school, the end of high school. Um, it, it sort of ends at the at graduation, you know, as an homage to um, like 80s films, you know, yeah, 80s coming of age films, like high school films where like it always ends with like graduation and you're like, yeah, I did it. Um, anyway, so I thought I would read um, for a bit from my memoir and then um take um, some questions and answers, or I will answer some questions. Although I, I always have questions to ask, but I probably don't have anyone to ask questions to. Um, so for the Zoom, um, especially for the reading, um, I have a slideshow that I'll share with you just because nobody wants to stare at my forehead um, for 10 minutes while I'm looking down at my book. So I'm gonna turn on my screen share um, and this will work great because we just tried it. There it is. That's me. That's uh, my book. Um, I'm going to collapse that really quick, I guess. This is screen share, so I'll leave it up, actually. All right, great. So um, so every chapter in my book is um, told is told through the lens of a great book of classic literature. So this first bit that I'm reading is from... Um, the prologue and it's called a picture of Dorian Gray. Um, and so I, I just have some pictures from my town and from my yearbook and family photos and things like that, that um, hopefully will be, uh, you know, at least give you something to look at. That's not my forehead. Um, so this is from the opening of um, my book. Nestled in the Susquehanna Valley town of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Carlisle Senior High School sprawled as a monolithic mid-century modern block of types, archetypes and stereotypes. Industrial gray lockers ringed its hallways, the compartments narrow enough to repel most of your textbooks, but wide enough to collect the trash and detritus from your backpack. It was your own personal landfill. Linoleum floors, classrooms with chables, the combo chair tables of the 70s, blackboards, American flags, loudspeakers from which the wah-wah-wah of adult speak would drone. Our school district was so large that the juniors and seniors had their own separate high school, the so-called senior high school, and the freshmen and sophomores had their own underclassmen high school building. Carlisle High School stocked its seats and bleachers with a familiar cast from the 80s, the athletes who towered above the rest of us, the cheerleaders who lay supine beneath them, the geeks with their physics books under their arms, the preps with their tree-torn swatches and impeccable Benetton sweaters, a handful of black kids with MC hammer pants and tall square afros tightly faded, punks and skaters with their leather jackets and black converse, a few swirly hippies, the rednecks with their oily palms and cigarettes and trucks. Carlisle High School was another cultural cul-de-sac built with the craftsman blueprint of John Hughes, the Frank Lloyd Wright of teen malaise. Overwhelmingly white, Carlisle's population offered all the rainbows of Caucasia. The town's main employers were Dickinson College, the Army War College, a smoky stack of factories, 
and the service industries that had sprung up to support the aforementioned trifecta. In the spirit of public education, we progeny were all in the mix together. The itinerant army brats, the ivory sons and daughters of professors, doctors, and lawyers, the greasy offspring of waiters, cooks, and factory workers, and the token refugee family. The Tran family blended right into the mix like proverbial flies in the ointment. That is to say, we didn't. Carlisle's glitter was unmistakably 80s, but its structure was straight from the post-war era, bricked together by the mortar of the 50s. We had a downtown Woolworths with a chrome luncheonette counter and red vinyl stools, and the grand movie theater with its incandescent marquee. The four corners of Carlisle's town square were righted by two courthouses and two churches, Episcopalian and Presbyterian. God and law and law and God. It wasn't a subtle message to any of us living in Carlisle, what was at the heart of the town. And the piece de resistance, our high school was the town's designated Cold War fallout shelter. The blue and yellow radiation placards festooned our hallways, reminding us that we were only a button push away from nuclear annihilation. From what I gleaned on television, Carlisle seemed like a slice of American pie a la mode. We bottled lightning bugs on summer nights. Trucks flew Confederate flags. We loitered at 7-Elevens and truck stops. We shopped at flea markets and shot pellet guns. My high school provided a daycare for girls who had gotten pregnant but were still attending classes. We stirred up marching band pride and fomented football rivalries. The auto shop kids rattled by in muscle cars and smoked in ash and cobbles before the first period bell. We were rural royalty, dairy queens and burger kings. So I'm going to read a passage from the fifth chapter. Um, this is entitled Man and His Symbols, named after the Carl Jung book. Um, for whatever reason, uh, as a 16-year-old teenager, I read Carl Jung, and I, I'm very sure that I did not understand everything I read, but what little I did understand really um, just blew my mind, this idea of archetypes and in literature and in dreams um, and in mythology, um, and it was amazing. And so um, I named and I tell the stories in chapter five through the lens of Carl Jung's Man and His Symbols. <clears throat> Um, the story takes place in 1983. Um, I am, it's a scene with my family, my parents, and my brother. His name is Lou. Um, and uh, I think that's about all. Oh, I should also name that, that there is um, a chain of rest uh, of uh, a chain of grocery stores in Pennsylvania called Giant. So um, when I refer to the Giant, that's um, that's the name of the store, not the descriptor of the store. <laughs> August, 1983. Where are you people from? We were shopping at Giant, pushing our cart slowly. My brother Lou and I took turns dangling from the cart, making impassioned pleas to our parents to buy Count Chocula. An older gentleman stepped into our path, intercepting us with his question, the question that, as I grew up in Carlisle, I would sustain regularly, a query angled with varying degrees of inflection, from curious to neutral, to cutting, where are you people from? Even at nine years old, I heard the nuances of you people. I caught his drift. His drift was sharp and edgy. It was pointed. His drift didn't sound like a friendly game of catch. My parents hadn't heard him because they were Vietnamesing with each other about their shopping list. And they weren't expecting anyone to speak to them. No one knew us in that informal, neighborly way, and my parents weren't part of the small-town colloquium that burbled and babbled around us. I saw other people, friends and neighbors, stopping and talking to one another. How's Little League? Donna doing okay? Did you see the game last night? We weren't in Little League. No one asked about my mother's health. We didn't watch sports on TV. The man spoke up louder with the kind of volume that inferred a lack of Englishing. Where are you people from? I nudged my father, who broke off from his conversation with my mother, to acknowledge the man. Yes, sir? Always publicly polite. 
Where are you people from? The man had yellow-tinted aviators and a graying mustache, reminding me of Magnum P.I. from TV. His belly overhung a large buckle, pressing taut against his plaid shirt. Maybe he was a private eye. Maybe he was working a case or was grocery store security. Oh, we're from Vietnam. My father smiled widely, nervously. His default was always to smile in awkward or strange situations, but I felt his posture tense up. My father also caught the man's drift, and he moved protectively in between the man and us. Yeah, thought so. Thought I recognized it. Vietnamese. I haven't heard it since I was in country. Thought to myself, sounds like Vietnamese. My brother Lou started to correct the man's pronunciation of Vietnamese, but I kicked him from behind the cart. Lou caught my drift as well, and he shut up. In the Marines there, stationed in Da Nang, 68 to 69. He looked at us all as he spoke, eyes slinking from my father's rigid smile to my mother, to us kids. Oh yes, Da Nang is in the middle of Vietnam. We're from Saigon. My father continued to smile as we stood still, nervous prey whiffing a predatory scent. My eyes scanned the American flag pin and other buttons on his jacket lapel. The gentleman looked at us, but his eyes were distant, their focus going far beyond where we were, right through us. I looked behind myself at the produce section, understanding that he wasn't looking at the broccoli or cabbage. Beautiful country there, Nam, he said, Nam with a southern lilt. Nam. Carlisle, surprising to most outsiders, has a slight southern drawl to its local dialect. Beautiful country, Nam. God damn shame what happened there. My father nodded. God damn shame, the man murmured. We all nodded and stood there for a time, staring at Mr. Magnum P.I. as he stared at the broccoli behind us. We, as a family in turn, looked blankly around. My parents gazed farther down the aisle, my brother Lou and I fidgeting wordlessly at the cart, everyone bobbling their heads. The man hadn't asked us another question, so we had no answer to give. Well, you people have a good day. Thank you. You too, sir. My father and mother smiled and waved. Lou had used the distraction to sneak a box of Count Chocolate into the cart. He nudged me. Why did that man ask us where we were from? My parents had already wandered farther down the aisle, sorting through the different cooking oils on the shelves. I was pushing the cart, so I answered Lou. Oh, because that man fought in the Vietnam War. The metal grocery cart resumed its screechy circuit in between the aisles. So? Well, we're from Vietnam. I said Vietnam the way the man had said it. Not me. I was born here in Carlisle. Lou had a point. Well, that is true, but people are always going to ask you where you're from. But I'm from Pennsylvania, spoken like the future lawyer he would be. Yeah, it's true. You were born here, but it won't make sense to people. They'll still ask you where you're from. They mean mom and dad, and me, your family, where we're from. How did that man know that we weren't from here? It's, it's complicated. I chose not to explain bigotry to Lou, though he probably already knew it. He had experience being the only one in his classes too, but at least the other one at school was his brother. I was blindly hoping that he wasn't aware of the prejudice, but who was I kidding? Whose innocence was I trying to preserve? Why did he say that it was a shame what happened? Lou persisted. I don't know. He didn't really say, did he? I was pained to tell Lou to get used to being asked where he was from, but he had to, and eventually he would whether I warned him or not. Get used to it, or get crushed by it. We all learned quickly to smile and nod whenever veterans would see us and tell us that they were in Nam. They named their branch of service, told us what years they were there, where they were stationed, and how they found the people or the weather. Later, when I was older and a little savvier, I would round up my exchange by saying something like, thanks for your service, or my grandparents worked for the U.S. Embassy, volunteering something to identify myself as one of the good ones. But that was much later when I realized that this wasn't about me or my family. It was about them and what we symbolized for them. How could I explain to Lou 
that we were symbols, that some people would never be able to see us as just people, that we were symbols of a painful and confusing war, symbols of the refugees that they saw on TV, symbols of what they were afraid of, symbols of the people who had shot at them and killed their friends, brothers, and sons, symbols of whatever they wanted to see. That was what we were for Mr. Magnum P.I. In the middle of the giant grocery store, we had to pause our shopping and be symbols for what he saw in the fuzzy distant gaze of recollection and trauma. The trans didn't choose to be symbolic or archetypal, but it wasn't our choice to make. Then I just have one more short selection from chapter 10, which is named after, or ch sorry, chapter eight, it's named after the metamorphosis um, by Franz Kafka. This is a very short reading and then we'll jump into the Q&A. Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis is a simple story. Gregor Samsa awakes to find himself transformed into a giant bug. When he discovers that he's a giant bug, he immediately looks at the clock and thinks about which train he can still catch to get to work on time. By himself, he's not freaking out about being a giant roach at all. His parents and sister, whom he's been supporting, freak out. His supervisor from work shows up and freaks out. Gregor has turned into a bug, but he does not freak out about his transformation until he has to navigate his relationships with his family and his work supervisor. You read the metamorphosis and you realize it's his family's ugliness toward Gregor that moves the story. Gregor is now a giant roach, and he cannot do anything about it. His family, instead of acting with compassion and kindness, sends Gregor to his room and locks the door. What's worse than turning into a giant bug? Turning into a giant bug and having your family act like a bunch of assholes. And isn't that adolescence? A biological change over which we have no control. And then our family, like a bunch of assholes, treats us like an insect in the middle of a metamorphosis that we ourselves hardly understand. Suddenly, with a different focus from the perspective of a bug, we can see who they really are. Alrighty. So stop the share. I think that's it for my presentation, as it were. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions. I don't know if Paige, if you want me to um, read questions or do you wanna MC the questions? Well, it doesn't seem like we currently have uh, questions in the chat, so I'll give people okay. a couple of minutes to think it through. But I, I'm fascinated, Fook. You mentioned um, your uh, that you initially became sort of obsessed with Hester Prynne and Hawthorne, and then you had <laughs> chapters that were named after Oscar Wilde and Carl Jung, and then and then Franz Kafka. What, I guess, what did you find yourself attracted to? What what kind of like elements of literature kind of drew you in? Um, to make you want to address those uh, through your book because they seem rather disparate. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean that's like that's such a big crux of the memoir. Um, but you know, I I was reading sort of voraciously anyway and secretly in high school, and then while I was working as a page at my town library, um, I was going through the discard pile in the basement, and I found um, I found Clifton Fadiman's. A lifetime reading plan. So Clifton Fadiman was this, he's very like kind of obscure now, but in the fifties, he was like this sort of this like public intellectual and like very famous. And he was like on game shows and things like that. And he had written a book called the lifetime reading plan. And I found it while I was sorting through the discard piles. Uh, and I just, you know, opened it, opened it up and read the introduction very quickly. And in the introduction, Clifton Fadiman writes, anybody who wants to be an all-American, these are his words, anyone who wants to be an all-American boy or girl needs to read these books. And I just thought, well, I want to be an all-American boy. Like, and so I, I bought that book for like 25 cents, you know, and um, it was like a list of like the Western canon. It was like the, you know, it was like literally started with like the Iliad, the Odyssey and Gilgamesh. And then it went all the way through, I think, you know, maybe like Henry James or something. I didn't read everything, but I tried to read everything, you know, and like if I was not interested in it, like I tried to read Faulkner and I was like, Bleh, you know, but <laughs> but other things I loved. So, yeah. 
Um, we had a question in the chat that says, uh, you seem to be a person who takes the meeting and why not? Uh, what do you think allows you access to your hopeful, positive and curious self? Um, gosh, that's that's a very generous take um, on my personality. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think I just feel like if I say no to things, I'll know exactly what happens, you know, that I'll just life will continue on as it as it is. Right. Like, I think saying yes to things is essentially another it's, it's another version or iteration of like Robert Frost's, you know, sort of like taking the road less traveled. Right. Like I. I, I know what will happen if I say no, like I'll just go home and, you know, make dinner and watch Netflix. But if I say yes to this, who knows what will happen, you know? And, and I think like, I think therapy has really like cured me of like, it, like not in a psych sociopathic way, but like, I, I'm not really like, I don't have like a shame thing. Like I'm not afraid of like being embarrassed or like being like, you know, from failure. Like that's just not even a thing anymore for me. Like, so I'm really just excited to live life and experience things and try you know hard and challenging and weird things and so yeah why not <laughs> why not why not uh, we have another question that asks uh can you compare the experiences of your daughters and their youth to your own um i mean i certainly can try uh i mean it's so it's so diff radically different like i you know and i can only I can only tell you what I am experiencing as their parent, you know, but, um, but I mean, I think uh, it couldn't be more different in some ways, you know, like they are growing up in like Northern New England, like Portland is very much like a, a bubble, a liberal bubble and in, in all the best and sort of challenging ways. Um, you know, I'm certainly not like abusive, like my father was, um, and, you know, and my wife is not negligent, like my, my mother was, is, you know, was, um so yeah I mean but you know yeah I mean I think yeah it, it's so so different you know and I think I, I couldn't speak to what I you know their experience is but I can only point out sort of like these very obvious things that I think make our experiences fundamentally different <clears throat> um we have another question here in chat that says do people still ask you where you're from and have you compared notes with other families from Vietnam who lived in other places in the U.S.? Yeah. Um, I, yes, but I think it's, it's funny before we got on. Um, yeah, I do get asked where I'm from, but it's mostly because I live in Maine <laughs> and I, I'm sure like people who live in Vermont also get the whole, like, are you from Vermont? You know, like I'm not from Maine. Um, and that's okay. Um, but I chose to live here and I'll live here until they kick me out. Um, uh, and yes, I, I have like, I've definitely compared notes with my cousins and, and I, other people, you know, I think, I think part of it was growing up in small town PA and predominantly white PA. Um, you know, my cousin who grew up in Southern California um, did not get that question of like, where are you from? Just because like her area had like so many different types of people from such diverse backgrounds um, that, that I think she didn't get. That. I mean, I'm sure she had her own travails. I just, it wasn't this sort of a constantly questioning like where you're from and the mm -hmm. sort of like the, the forever foreigner thing. Um, we have a comment here, other uh, rather than a question, uh, and I have to say I 100% agree with this this uh, statement. Your use of the metamorphosis as adolescence analogy, chef's kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I'm sure that that is not what you know uh, Franz Kafka intended, but you know, boy, when you're a 16 year old kid and you're reading that, like it just I was like really like thunderstruck. I was like, I I know what this is about. Like you know, it's just about like being weird and your family acting like terrible. <laughs> so I thought. <laughs> do you mind if I ask a question, Paige? Please do. Yeah. Uh, so I was a punk rock kid also from grew up in Pennsylvania. So um, I, I did want to ask about, so I really resonated with you saying, you know, punk rock, which can seem so threatening to people who are not in the scene can really provide this safe haven and this home for people who, um, feel that they don't belong in other places. Um, I, I have read, you know, a fair bit, I think of Hanifa Burakib has talked about being um, a black kid in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and his experiences in the punk scene in the Midwest. Um, James Spooner, I'll drop a link to his book, which is amazing, called High, yeah, Desert. High Desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, he the came, graphic he, novel, yeah. He came to Burlington, um, in 2022 to talk about 
about high desert and and I was just curious about your experience as a Vietnam Vietnamese kid in um, what my guess was a uh, you know having been in the central Pennsylvania punk scene and New Jersey punk scene it was overwhelmingly white um, you know did did you still find this place of uh, community and of acceptance and belonging? Yeah, I mean, for me, for sure, you know, like, I think, uh, yes, um, because I think, you know, I just thought, well, you know, I mean, all my friends are white, you know, and I was like, well, if, if these white kids don't feel like their white parents get them either, like, it must not be about race, or at least not in, in our scene, like, you know, it's like, it just must be something else, like, it must be generational or cultural or, you know, ethical or who, you know, who knows what, but um, I took a lot of solace in that, you know, because I thought, well, like, it's not like these white kids have it on easy street either, you know, like they're dealing with, you know, alcoholic parents and all sorts of other things. Um, you know, you know, like in, in hindsight, like we didn't talk a ton about race, you know, and that was also like in the eighties was when like that big, like the, like the first round of like, you know, the neo-Nazi scare came up. And so, you know, there were like, you know, like all of the, um, sharps, you know, and like all the anti-fascist skinheads. So like, we were just like, so like in our mind, we were like, we're going to fight racism by like fighting skinheads. Like we're you know, racist skinheads. Like that's what we're going to do. And like, that's how you fix racism. Like instead of like sort of talking about like larger, like structural racism, right. And <laughs> like things like that. Um, so I definitely found a place in the scene, you know, at the same time, I think, and many people can talk about this, uh, you know, that, you know, punk sort of paints itself into a corner very quickly, you know, um, like, you know, in this idea of like being a poser, you know, like that was like really also really prevalent in our, our punk scene. And I, I really, I didn't understand that, you know, I also didn't want to jeopardize my place of belonging in it, but, but to me, it felt really provincial and small town and, and, um, you know, this idea of like the, like my friends are like deeply, like very dogmatic in their punk rock. I was like, if you listen to punk rock, like you didn't listen to like rap or you didn't listen to like metal or like soul or anything like you just you only had to listen to punk. Like you didn't listen to like New Order because they weren't punk or, you know, whatever it was, you know. And I was like secretly like, but like I like New Order. I don't know. Like, you know, so it was, you know, it, it punk has its own problems, too. I mean, as, as every punk can attest to, but it's also like nobody gets to hate it except me because <laughs> I love it too much. <laughs> Um, Fook, there's another question here that says, what is your experience of learning languages, formal lessons, textbooks, beginning readers? Uh, are they super easy for you to pick up? Um, gosh, I don't. Yeah. At this point, I, I think so. I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, when I went off to college, you know, I, so I, I grew up bilingual in English and Vietnamese, but my Vietnamese is sort of like, I, I'm like, I like to joke, you know, it's sort of, it's like frozen and like being like a second or third grader and I never learned to read or write it but um and then when I went off to college I did classical languages you know so I learned Latin and Greek um and at, I went off to college at Bard and and in our classics program at the time we learned Latin Greek and Sanskrit so I did that and then I thought I was going to go to Germany for grad school for their classics program because uh, it was free and also like um you know uh very prestigious so I I did like a crash course, like German immersion, and then studied in Germany for a summer. So I, I and I ended up taking so much German that I ended up minoring in German as well. Um, and then while I was living in New York, I I took French classes at Alliance Francaise, uh, just because I have relatives in France, so I wanted to be able to speak to them. I guess I I yeah I don't I I like learning languages. We were just in Iceland, and I was like nerding out over Icelandic. Boy, Icelandic is super crazy. Um, I don't know if I, I learn a lot of languages badly. I guess I'll say that <laughs> <laughs> really badly, but with a lot of enthusiasm. So, yeah. <laughs> um, in, in terms of uh, language, there's another question here that, uh, I mean, sort of a, a, a very messy segue that I just uh, put there. Uh, did you step <laughs> into the role of a translator for your parents in the early years in Pennsylvania? Um, I, you know, I, I don't think so. I was because, you know, what I was two or three and my so I think like I was only speaking Vietnamese at the same time that my dad was only speaking Vietnamese. And so we both kind of learned English at the same time. And very early on, um, my dad 
um, dedicated himself to just speaking English to me and my brother um, to practice his English at home. So, um, so like, I think like very early on, I didn't translate for my parents, but I would help them with pronunciation. Like I very, very clearly remember there's like a story in my book, even about like, um, like sort of helping my dad pronounce words, um, and, and things like that. So, so like I would correct his English, but I wouldn't translate for him. Um, Which kind of piggybacking on that question, I want to add, what about as a cultural translator? Because I imagine that as a child growing up in school, you had a, a, a much more severe crash course in in American culture than your parents would have had as adults. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, I think like my brother and I were always sort of like that. That's not how we do things here. You know, but also there's like this like piece of like, you know, in Vietnamese culture, like kids don't, you know, there's a very rigid and strict hierarchy of like, you know, respect, power, you know, let's just call it what it is, like power. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kids did not talk back to their parents, you know, um, or if they did, you know, there were some you know, repercussions um, for that. So, so we didn't even really help them acculturate because like, you know, like they would just be like, you're a dumb kid. Like, what do you know? You know, so <laughs> like, we'd be like, you don't need to do that or, you know, whatever. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, on a different uh, level of questioning, this one is, what's your favorite Ramon song? <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, Sheena's a punk rocker. I mean, it's like, it's so basic, but like really pretty classic, right? You know? Yeah. Bonzo Goes to Bitburg is also pretty great. I mean, and also let's just, let's, let's be honest. There, there's only one Ramon song. They just kept recording it over and over again. <laughs> And it's really good. It's one really good song. It's like the Rolling Stones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just different, uh, a different seasoning in it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's controversial. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I have a question for you, and I hope you didn't answer this already when you were speaking, and then I just missed your answer. No, no, when it's okay. You, um, when you received the request to write the the story for Cranky, did you have uh, were you given like a storyboard that you were working from, or was it a concept that you were working from, and then this you wrote the story, and then the illustration comes out of that? Uh, how, how did that? What was that process like? Yeah, I didn't say yeah. So they just sent me six six pictures, and it was really just to kind of get a lay of the land for who Cranky was, and then they just said, you know, they said we we want to sort of focus on like socio emotional learning. Like that was it. Like there was no like plot narrative or anything like that. And I was like, okay, you know, so it wasn't like write a story about like Cranky going to outer space, you know, or, you know, Cranky saves the world. Um, <clears throat> and I was like, yeah, so like Cranky's cranky and, you know, he's in a really bad mood and they're like, yeah, but, you know, and the only other thing they said was, you know, but he's really good at his job. And I was like, yeah, I can, I can write that. Or at least I wrote the story that I would have wanted to have read my kids, you know, when they were very little, you know, at that point, like they had sort of phased out of like picture books, but, you know, so I think like, I hope that when kids read it, it comes out next week that, you know, the, the big takeaway um, for parents and kids is that, you know, you're, you're feeling your, especially your bad moods are not something that need to be fixed, you know, that you just are in a bad mood and that's okay. And that you still need to show up and do what, you know, your what do what you need to do do the things that you're responsible for and see that through um despite your bad mood um but also to you know give kids permission just to be cranky and to not know why like that's okay too um i think like i'm i, I want to sort of counter like toxic positivity a little bit you know that like everything's got to be okay and you got to be optimistic and everything's going to work out i don't you know we can't guarantee any of that um but we can affirm kids feelings uh, the follow-up to that one is somebody's asking if the other two stories they asked you to write were also about Cranky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the two sequel, yeah, it's like we've created a whole Cranky verse. We call it like the Cranky <laughs> universe. And yeah, 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 yeah. So the second cranky one. Cranky the new Thomas. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> much more unpleasant though. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's like the anti-Thomas. Yeah, maybe we'll have like some sort of like universe crossover, like multiverse crossover where like Cranky and Thomas fight or something. It would be really funny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would definitely read that. <laughs> <laughs> Cranky beats the crap out of Thomas. I love that. <laughs> um, I think that's that's uh, that's all we have right now for our questions. So. Great.
Well, thank you so much. No, thank you so much. This has been um, an absolutely fabulous uh, talk to to listen to your story and uh, and just just having this uh, back and forth. So appreciate it very much. And you said uh, Cranky comes out. Uh, is, is it next week? Yeah, February sixth. Yep. Oh, fantastic! All right. Well, hopefully, uh, every library around is going to be uh, oh. having Cranky as part of story time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>